to the First and Deputy First, and we now move on to questions to the Minister of Education. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Question number one. The first draft of the feasibility study for the new building at St Joseph's High School was submitted to the Department week ending the 20th of February 2015. When the feasibility study has been signed off, the Department will undertake the economic appraisal business case. DFP approval will be required for this business case due to the value of the project. Provided there is no delay due to the issues with the feasibility study, it is currently anticipated that BC approval could be obtained as early as April 2015. The procurement of the integrated design team to take forward the project as a designed and bill will be carried out in tandem with the preparation of the business case. However, the appointment cannot be made until the approval of the business case is obtained. This project is still at early planning stage and hence there is not yet a programme time frame for, uh, available for the build and design. Mr Bradley for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister. And uh, it is, of course, the first day of Irish Language Week, so uh, I would urge all members to do their best to use Irish during their questions or answers. Um, I thank the Minister, as I said, for his answer. The Minister, as you will know, that I have raised this issue on a number of occasions, and uh, he has responded very positively by uh, visiting the school and by his announcement of funding. Can I ask the Minister, can he give us an assurance that his department will uh, facilitate the new bill process in every way possible? I thank the member for his question and, and uh, welcome uh, his comments in relation to Shocked and the Gaelic as well. Uh, I, I can assure the member that uh, I am wedded to this project, that I, my department and I are driving it forward. And he will note even from my answer, uh, we are working uh, our way through the project. It is quite a significant uh, public investment and we have to follow proper protocol and policies, not only of my own department, but that of DFP. But I think things are moving up forward well, and without being preemptive, uh, if we can get the business case approved by April, that will move us on to the next stage. I call Mr William Mervyn. Uh, when the Minister is just, uh, answering questions in, in my constituency, can the Minister uh, let us know if we will pri prioritise the new building at Market Hill High School in County Amma? Um, we have quite a significant number of schools within our estate, both at primary level and post-primary level, that require uh, new builds or significant investment. Um, I'm not in a position to announce any further building programmes at this stage, uh, and depending on how the budget, the capital budget in particular, works out through 15-16, that will decide as to whether any future capital investment announcements are made during this Assembly term. It may be the duty of the next Assembly or the next Minister. Uh, to make announcements around future bills going in uh, to the years beyond 15-16, but I continue to keep the situation under review. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers to date. I mean, obviously, th there is uh, a good presentation here in relation to uh, capital projects in Uri Arma. I'm just wondering if the Minister could take this opportunity to give an update on capital projects across the North. Uh, of the, I have made a number of announcements uh, since coming into post. Uh, 2012, I made an announcement at that stage of 18 projects valued at eight, £133 million. Uh, eight school builds are now on site. Arvalee Special School is due to go on site in March 2015, with a further five going on site early in the financial year, the start of the next financial year. St George Resource Centre is now complete. The 2013 announcement of a total of 22 projects valued at £222 million. Currently, there are eight business cases approved and work is progressing well on the remainder. Eight of the projects are currently expected to move on to site in 15-16, subject to availability of capital uh, in subsequent years. I also made an announcement in 2014. These projects are at the very early stage of planning and are going through the appropriate uh, policy development and business cases, etc. It's vitally important that we are able to announce business or 
uh, capital builds, because it does take a significant number of years from announcement to put a capital, uh, a new build on site. So we do do this uh, years in advance. We have to ensure then that the money is there to follow them up. And unfortunately, my department's capital budget is not what I would have liked to have seen. As I'm sure, uh, my executive colleagues as well. We all want to see further investment in capital uh, across the executive. But I will keep the situation under review. And if I believe it is appropriate to make an announcement of further capital bills for years going forward, I will do so later on in 15. Thank you, and if I could just inform members <clears throat> that questions three, four, and seven have been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Paul Given. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could I uh, ask question number two, please? The number of pupils that fail to complete the years in 13 and 14 is relatively small. The school leaver survey shows that in 2012-13, some 522 pupils left post-primary school without completing year 13 and 305 without completing year 14. The survey also shows that the majority of these pupils, 76% of those leaving year 13 and 71% of those leaving year 14, went on to further education colleges, employment or training. Many of those that failed to complete year 13 or year 14 do so because they are not content with their chosen pathway and to decide to change direction. It is important, therefore, that young people are supported in making the right choices at the right time. Effective and timely careers guidance is important to support young people in making informed choices. That is why I welcome the recent review of the joint DE Dale career strategy, which found that the strategy is sound and has resulted in significant improvements in the delivery of careers education over the past four years. In the comments of Paul Given for a supplementary. Can I thank uh, the Minister for that response? And uh, whilst it's a small number, I would be interested in to know how many make an in year change, at, at least at the start of the year, and then uh, they decide to change to a, a college. I know when I was 16, uh, I went to Lisburn College, realised the course wasn't for me, and went back to the secondary school to then do A levels. And so I think those statistics I think, would provide an interesting insight. But what further steps can be taken to try and minimise? this type of change that takes place because obviously there is a, a cost to the taxpayer, there is a lost opportunity to the young people that are involved and what more could be done to try and uh, limit these experiences that we're having. Uh, thank you, Member. I know the Member has asked previous questions in relation to this matter and, and some statistics were provided at that stage. And it's when and how the statistics are gathered uh, and uh, provided which uh, will illuminate as to some of the points you've made in relation to us at the start of the year, middle of the year, when, when do young people make these choices. And I suspect it is a mixture of, of both, but I will uh, investigate to see if we have the, the detail of, of the question, which you, or the chance of the question uh, which you've posed to me. But in relation to how we ensure that young people uh, make the right choices, it's down to careers advice. It's down to ensuring that young people are fully informed of the career options they have and the pathways they will have to follow and where those pathways will lead them if they take certain um, subject choices. And as I mentioned in my original answer to you, the recent review of the career strategy has been quite positive, pointing out that, that we are beginning to make positive changes uh, to careers advice and that young people are now receiving uh, much improved careers advice than they have done in previous years. But we will continue to keep that matter under review. And I call Mr Sean Rogers. Mr. Speaker and Minister, you rightly put the emphasis on the careers education programme. What discussions have you had with the Department of Employment and Learning to bring forward, forward the recommendations from the careers review? Um, I have had a number of discussions directly with the Minister, and my officials are engaged in discussions with his officials in regards to this matter. And we are continuing to uh, investigate as to how we bring forward the recommendations contained within the review, particularly in what is a very constrained bu budgetary period for both departments. Mr. Danny Kinna. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far, and it's good to hear that it's so few. Um, but has the Minister thought about or even discussed with um, officials the idea in the UK that's been suggested of actually extending the school years to s including 17 and 18 year olds? Or adding some flexibility into the system? Um, I, I think the member is referring to the compulsory age of leaving school to 17 or 18. I think it's something that's worth exploring. Now, I'm not proactively doing that, but I think in terms of the changes to people's lifestyles, um, 
We are, and the figures show that more and more young people are staying in education beyond the age of 16, 17, 18. Um, our, our career pathways are changing, our education system is changing, and indeed the skills bases which our employers require are changing. Um, and as we all know, we are now expected to work longer. So I think it is important that we start looking back down the track in terms of when our young people, or how long our young people should stay at school. It, it will be uh, a wide-ranging debate, also have implications for a significant number of departments, but I think it has positive outcomes for young people. It have a, may well have a positive outcome for our economy. And whether I have the opportunity to explore it during this term in office, I do believe it's something that uh, our society, our executive, needs to start discussing in detail. I'm going to call Mr. Barry Michael. Akesh Devarakuig, question number five. Uh, go on, Boykis. Listen, Valor and Kesh. Uh, the Lisson Alley Shared Education Campus, LSEC, Community Stakeholder Group, held its inaugural, inaugural meeting in December 2014 and is due to meet again in the near future. The group includes representations from the District Council, community organisations and statutory bodies. Its main focus is to contribute to the achievement of the vision and objectives of the LSEC programme through a process of ongoing two-way engagement that allows for consideration of issues which may impact on the local community. The group will achieve this by exploring how opportunities and benefits for, this, for the OMA area can be maximised in terms of economic, social and community regeneration objectives. Following the group's first meeting and reflecting the areas discussed and ideas generated, my department, in conjunction with other departments and relevant organisations, is examining the provision of additional community services and facilities that may be provided on this site. Progress will be communicated to the group at its next meeting. As part of a wider communication strategy, work has also commenced to develop an overarching brand and vision for the campus. My department has written to community stakeholder groups asking for its involvement in that exercise. Members of that group will be consulted to ensure that the views of the local community, young people and other key stakeholders on the development of the site and brand are captured. I would also note that at the request of the group, OMA Youth Council, has nominated two of its members to sit on the group. This will help to ensure the views of young people and potential of the LSEC pupils are captured and taken into account of. Good. Call Mr. Michael Duff for a supplement. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed his pioneering work in leading this uh, iconic Listen LA Education campus? Can I just ask the Minister if he could perhaps indicate the key milestones that are up ahead uh, for the project, you know, in terms of this calendar year, in terms of maybe future calendar years, are we on course for, uh, is it the 2020 opening or whatever, of uh, the, the various schools that will be on this site? So just what are the key milestones up ahead? Uh, the key milestones up ahead is the starting of the RLE Special Needs School, uh, and then that is on, on track. Uh, we are on track to have uh, schools on site uh, towards 2020. Um, there has been significant progress made over this last year and a half uh, in moving this project forward, and it is the biggest capital project which the, the executive is currently involved in. Uh, it's a massive investment uh, in shared education. It's a massive investment uh, in the OMA area. And I know at times progress has been frustrating uh, for the local community, uh, but we are now uh, back on track and ensuring that things are moving forward. In terms of Specific dates, uh, Arvely School is expected to open in September 2016. A contract for wide, uh, site-wide demol demolition has recently been awarded and work has commenced on the site. Planning of future phases of development is ongoing in, in close consultation with the relevant schools and schools authority. It is expected that construction of the five post-primary schools will commence in 2017, uh, with the campus opening in September 2020. So we are moving ahead after long years of uh, visioning and, and talking and, and planning this project. There is actual physical work taking, on, taking place on the site. There is employment being generated uh, in the local community on the site. And the schools in the Oma area are at the very heart of planning this site moving forward. And as I've said in, in, in my original answer, uh, many aspects and different aspects of the community are also involved in it as well. Good, Mr. Tom Buchanan. 
view, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And Minister, progress has been slow in this and has been very frustrating. But uh, you, you do make mention that it's going to be open by 2020. Is that actually subject to funding, or will that actually be something that will take place on the ground in 2020? Well, unfortunately, everything in this life is subject to funding, but it is uh, part of our forward planning. And when we sit down to talk about capital moving forward in the future years, uh, listen, Ali says it's always front and centre because we know it. Firstly, it's a programme for government commitment. There has been some delays to it in the past, and we were determined to deliver it on time. And I think once the, the RLE school, uh, as I say, is expected to open in September 2016, with work commencing on that very, very shortly, uh, people will then have the confidence that this site is for real, uh, the schools are moving on to it, and that the executive will deliver on its programme for government target. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what level and type of shared contact uh, he hopes for between pupils at shared education of this kind and how he will know if it has been achieved? Well, I, I wish for the maximum amount of sharing uh, on site and the local schools are involved in those discussions as to how and when they use the various facilities and how schools use them together and how the young people on the site become a common identity with different schools, with different ethoses on the site, but a common identity of, uh, of pupils attending uh, the Lisson Alley Education Campus and being proud of that corporate identity as well. Uh, how will we know it has worked? Well, I, I think the commitment uh, of the local schools and stakeholders in OMA will make it work. Uh, and I, think, I have no doubt over many years there will be many sc uh, scrutiny and case studies of the Lisson Alley site. There will be at times, I think there will be a, learn, a, a steep learning process for some people. But I, what uh, encourages me as Minister is that people are willing to learn and challenge each other and challenge themselves uh, about the shared education site at uh, OMA. So it's a very, it is a Pathfinder project. It uh, offers massive opportunities uh, for the community of OMA and indeed I think massive opportunities uh, right across the north as well. And I call Lord Morrow. Thank you. Number six. Yeah. Uh, my proposals following the review of SEN on inclusion contain measures to introduce the time for completion of statutory assessments for SEN children in all schools. The proposals also aim to reduce administration around statementing. I propose a reduction uh, to 20 weeks in the time frame for statutory assessment and statementing. A revised statutory code of practice will set out practical arrangements for the education authority and schools to meet the child's special educational needs. This will follow provision in the Special Educational Needs and Disability Bill and the supporting regulations. The revised code will describe the new processes for three levels of support and the respective duties of boards of governors and the authority. It will complement the anticipated streamlined process following the creation of the education authority. In order to reduce the administrative burden associated with annual reviews of statements, I propose some reviews will provide an opportunity for a swifter process. This would require parents and schools to be fully satisfied with the current provision in a statement. Both parents and schools will have to agree that a review involving other advice givers is not necessary. The Department will indicate to the Authority and schools that acceptable timeframes for completion of assessment and provision of supports, ongoing capacity ability training uh, for special educational needs coordinators has been delivered to ensure that schools are fully informed about the processes for the identification and assessment of children's needs. I intend that this will be supplemented by training for each uh, school and Board of Governors on the new SEN framework prior to implementation. For well, I thank the Minister for his answer, but I, I didn't quite catch whether he said he hopes to reduce it to 20 weeks to process or it is uh, 20 weeks for processing at the moment. And if he, if he could just clarify that point when he rises to, to speak again. Uh, does he accept that, in fact, this is taking too long anyway, and that it, in fact, is affecting the development of some students, the time it's taken to assess this? The current time frame is 26 weeks, so we wish to reduce that to 20 weeks uh, in, in the legislation and regulations. I, I note that the member has been asking a significant number of written questions in relation to special educational needs, and I'm more than happy for, uh, to offer their, my officials 
for a meeting with himself to discuss the issues of concern to him. Uh, there's clearly issues uh, which he is uh, bearing down on and uh, wishes further clarification on. So if it is, if it is of assistance to him, um, I'm more than happy for my officials to meet with him to discuss those matters further. I'm to John Dallet. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. And, you know, given the awful legacy of illiteracy and innumeracy inherited from predecessors, what hope can the Minister give to parents who believe their child has got uh, special needs, but the ed ed Education Authority believes otherwise? How will those parents uh, approach the tribunal, and what support will they have in doing that? I would first encourage parents to talk to uh, their teacher in the school and then, if need be, to follow that up the chain to the Board of Governors and or the principal of the school and discuss the matter in detail to ensure that there, whatever support is required for the child is being delivered if it is in the responsibility of the school or as we move forward to the Education Authority. In all of these cases, there is an appeal mechanism in place. Uh, and I will encourage parents to follow that mechanism through uh, to its conclusion as well. I hope to, I've introduced a bill this morning which will go to its second reading next Tuesday. Uh, and what we are attempting to do is to modernise special educational needs, to deliver a more effective, efficient service uh, to children and families in schools. Um, the bill, I quite rightly will attract significant attention. I have no doubt that the Education Committee will scrutinise it in great detail. I have already committed to working with the Education Committee in regards to this matter. There are many matters I bring before the Assembly which I am prepared to dig my heels in over uh, and fight the good fight. This is not one of them. I believe that if the Assembly works together on this and the Committee and the Minister and vice versa work together and the Minister works with the Assembly, we can achieve a uh, a statementing process and a special educational needs bill which does meet the needs of our young people. Call John McKellis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I actually welcome uh, the Minister's commitment to cut the, the time from 26 weeks to 20 weeks. He will also be aware that I've written to him recently about uh, a constituent. And the broad context of that would be is he prepared now to say that he will accept statements from other parts of the UK? And would that not help to, to streamline and having to repeat the same process? Will he get up now and give a commitment to uh, accept statements from right across the constituent parts of the UK? This isn't an issue about constituent parts of the UK, as you put it. It's, it's nothing to do with my views on the, on the constitution of uh, this society or this, the North, whatever you want to call it. This is to do with, and I set this out in great detail in the latter in fairness to uh, or, or, or the written response. This is to do with the different emphasis being placed by perhaps England or Scotland or Wales in relation to the statementing process. So the, the statementing process may be different in England, Scotland or Wales than it is here, and there are variances within that, as is the case when a young person would travel from here uh, to Britain with in relation to a statement. So that, those are just facts we have to deal with. I want to deal with them. Uh, as quickly as possible, I want to remove obstacles from parents and children in these circumstances, not place obstacles in their way. And I can assure the member, if there's any uh, way around these matters, which do not interrupt with the legislative process we have to follow, because statementing, etc., is all set down in legislation. So it's not simply a matter for the minister to dismiss. I can assure the member that I not place any obstacles in the way uh, of ensuring that young people receive the services they require, regardless of where they are from. Under, over Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Minister, and, and I might have uh, missed listening to the answer to that last question. So, we'll, um, although I've been listening to all the rest, could the minister? Um, I appreciate what the minister said about cutting the weight from the uh, aimed of 26 weeks to the 20 weeks. Um, uh, although I recognise that, that that's not always been met in the past. Um, and will the, will the minister guarantee that the upcoming bill uh, will end the current postcode lottery? Well, one of the reasons uh, initially why the bill was brought forward was an attempt to end the postcode lottery because there is a difference of delivery of some of the services across the various boards. Now we have the education authority in place and will allow that body to bring together best practice uh, from across the boards. Now that will take uh, some time to do that because they have a significant uh, work programme in front of them. But in terms of, of the legislation, 
the, legis the shape of the legislation now rests with the Assembly. I, as sponsoring minister, have an agreement from the executive to bring forward a bill. That bill will be introduced. It will go through the various stages of the Assembly. And the final bill will be as uh, the shape of it will be as the Assembly dictates. Um, I'm prepared to work with the Assembly. I'm working with the committee and vice versa. We've had a very good working relationship on this matter to date. And I hope to continue that. And I have no reason to suspect that won't be the case. So let's produce an act which meets the needs of our young people at the end of this journey. And I call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Question number eight, Mr. Speaker. Um, question number eight. The percentage of pupils attending integrated schools that are eligible for assistance with home to school transport are primary 17.8%. Post primary 51.9%. Wilson, a quick supplement. The discrepancy between the number of or the percentage of pupils who qualify for free school transport in the integrated sector compared to the uh, control and maintained sector is a ratio of about three to one, which partly explains the popularity of the integrated sector, especially at secondary level. This has an unfair advantage and presents an unfair advantage for integrated schools over and above maintained and um, uh, uh, controlled schools adjacent to them. It distorts the budget. It also distorts the capital budget. Is what is the Minister coming? doing and, and what consideration is he giving to ensure that there is a level playing field when it comes to this very important incentive for pupils to attend one sector as opposed to another? Uh, the, the member will be aware that I recently uh, received the transport review, uh, which is quite a detailed document and has studied our transport system in great detail and come forward with a significant number of recommendations. It is my intention in the coming months to publish that uh, document for consultation uh, and from that consultation bring forward uh, changes as required to our transport system as is then themed or felt to be required to ensure that we have a level playing field for everyone. Are you going to come, Sir Alec Matt? Um, Kerst, Deborah and E, Liddell. Uh, go on, Breaker Station, Valor and Kerst. Uh, the Education Authority was, a fo was formally established as a body corporate on the 12th of December 2014. The Education Library Boards and their staff commission will be dissolved on the 1st of April 2015. And their assets, liabilities, duties, functions, and staff transferred to the Education Authority. The Education Authority will become operational on that date. Thank you for Can I thank the Minister for that response? Can I ask the Minister, could he advise the House when the new appointees to the, uh, the Board would be publicly announced? Um, a number of the appointees ha have been recently informed that their uh, nomination has been accepted. The, the Chair has been recently informed uh, of, of their appointment and um, formal letters, etc., have been exchanged. I am reluctant to announce names just at this stage because I am not 100 per cent sure that everyone has been formally informed and formally accepted uh, their nominations at this stage, but I can assure the member that it is well advanced and that there will be a board in place by the 1st of April. Uh, that ends the period for listed questions, and we move on now to topical questions. And I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister referred um, earlier to the introduction of the Special Education Needs Disability Bill uh, next week. And given the fact that uh, health issues uh, can often impinge upon uh, special educational needs. Can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with uh, the Health Minister in relation to this bill? Um, I have had no discussions with the current Health Minister. But I have had significant discussions with his uh, predecessor, because, simply because uh, of the time scales in which the bill was being drew up uh, and introduced and prepared for delivery to the Executive. Uh, my officials are in regular engagement with uh, health officials in regards to this matter, uh, both previous, under the previous health minister and under the current uh, health minister. And I have no doubt as the bill progresses, as matters arise, myself and the health minister will have engagements around any of those particular points. Adley for supplementary. 
Grumilmaya got the risk, can call your Gascom, Puekas, Foster, Lishanara, and Sokta Ragra. Um, too often in the past, uh, parents and schools have said that there is a, a silo mentality in relation to health and education around these issues. Uh, can the Minister give the House an, assur an assurance uh, that this bill will contain provisions which will break down those silos? Um, I am satisfied that the, the, the current bill allows for a closer working relationship between my department and the health department. And indeed, I believe that the mentality of silos across the executive has been broken down over this last number of years with a better working relationship among ministers, those that sometimes in the public you may not believe that, but also in terms of a better working relationship which has been sponsored by the civil service themselves in regards to cross-departmental working. So I believe that the bill presents us with an opportunity to enhance that, to increase that, but I am also put on record the significant amount of cross-departmental work that already takes place. I call Mr Jim Allister. Why is the Minister appointing someone as Chair of the New Education Authority who has no education background and someone who on the day they leave their existing post will leave with a £250,000 golden handshake and then walk into a public appointment which he is gifting to her? Uh, I am satisfied that all appointments I have made uh, to date, including that of the Chair of the Education Authority, uh, are the correct appointment, that they meet the criteria of uh, the post and that the person involved will be more than capable of delivering quite a challenging role in the, in the time ahead and ensuring that we end up with a, a body which is made up of different um, sectors <coughs> operating as the one sector for the, for the betterment of our education system. Mr. Alistair, for uh, given the uh, background of the other two shortlisted persons that the minister considered? Is he playing the green card in appointing Ms O'Connor? Uh, I find that question totally unacceptable uh, and an accusation that I have acted in an inappropriate and indeed illegal manner, manner. And I would ask the Speaker to investigate that. I would ask the Speaker to investigate the comments of Mr Allister because he has accused me not only of breaking the ministerial code but acting illegally. Order. Order. And just let me respond to uh, your point of order. Uh, as the question was presented, and was presented as a question, not as an accusation, but I will stu study Hansard. Uh, my first impression is that, in fact, he didn't make an accusation. He asked uh, a rhetorical question, perhaps provocatively so. Mr Speaker, when will the Minister be in a position to announce the next round of capital funding projects for new build schools? Um, I'm not sure when that will be. I have to see in terms of, I have to firstly formally announce the outcome of the education budget, both in terms of resource and capital, and I'm before the Education Committee on Wednesday uh, to do so. It depends how the capital programme out rolls out this year and how much uh, investment and spend we get on the ground within this year and how we believe that will impact moving into 16-17. I would like to be in a position to make a further announcement uh, in this financial year, but I cannot confirm that at this stage. Mr Pitch for supplementary. I, I trust that when the Minister is uh, looking at this particular uh, opportunity, um, that he will not ignore the, the chance of, of looking at the educational lead in uh, Dremour High School, a school which was developed uh, many years ago for around half the population that it currently caters for, a school that which performs uh, particularly well in, in, in the local community and is very well regarded, and a school which hasn't got the, the facilities now in terms of recreational facilities uh, which are suitable uh, for the needs of that school community. I, I am acutely aware of the needs of Dromore High School. The member and a number of his colleagues have uh, raised the issue with me on numerous occasions. The member will also be aware that I have recently approved expenditure to purchase uh, a site for a new build. So I think it's, I, I can't preempt any announcement going into the future, but uh, I certainly want to follow up on their initial investment we have made on a site. 
Thank you. And Commissioner Mickey Brady. Um, would the Minister agree that there is a need for education to work with other departments to fight austerity? Uh, I, I, there is, and I think in terms of many around the executive table who have approached the recent Stormont House Agreement, have approached uh, the current budget, that we are doing our best to mitigate against the worst aspects of austerity. Uh, we are doing it, however, in the context of a much reduced budget, uh, both in terms of resource and capital, but I think the decisions that have been made uh, at the executive are uh, ensuring that the quality of life of many of our young people, or many of our people, uh, and indeed young people at our schools, are greatly improved than those if we were left uh, to someone else to make those decisions. I call Mr. Brady for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could I ask the Minister his views on the current strike action within teachers' unions? Go to my um, Teachers' unions and indeed other public sector workers have decided to move forward towards ballot for strike action. They are perfectly entitled to do so. Uh, I do not think any of the teachers' unions have announced yet the outworkings uh, of those ballots, um, and we will wait to see what the decision of their membership is. I can assure both the unions and their membership, and indeed the general public, that I am doing everything within my power to, to uh, obtain as much investment for education as possible. Uh, the member will note that as part of the final budget settlement, the executive agreed to an additional £64 million for education. And it's worth noting, uh, and I made this point recently at a teachers' conference, teachers' trade union conference, that between the draft budget and the final budget, the executive increased investment in public services. If, as some wish, that the Tories take over here directly, and we have direct rule, any change between the draft budget and the final budget, any funds that became available would not have been invested in public services. They would have been sent directly back to the Treasury. So, As a result of interventions by myself, the Executive and others, we have ensured that there is an additional £64 million in education. If others had their way, that £64 million would have been straight back to the Treasury. Thank you. And it comes to Roy Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, recently, the Minister has indicated that he has a list on his table of about 100 schools that he would like to be rebuilt. Can the, the Minister indicate what plans he has to increase the transparency of the process so that there is a greater understanding of the cumulative pressures for capital rebuild and a greater level of uh, transparency as to how projects are prioritised? Um, Will be aware, should be aware that after my announcement uh, in 2013 or 2014, I published on my department's website the criteria which is used for the selection of new builds. Uh, there is no onus on me to do so. The authority rests solely with the minister as to which new builds would go ahead. But I do believe in transparency in government. I do believe in accountability. Hence the reason I published uh, the criteria. And Mr. Beggs for a supplementary. Would the Minister acknowledge that it would be healthy uh, if there was a wider understanding of the pressures and the poor conditions of some of our schools and the need for this rebuilding, so that when deciding do we build uh, new departmental headquarters, new civil service headquarters, that there is thought about what is the cost, the other options that are being missed, and, the, and that uh, all other departments could be prioritised appropriately? Well, I think in general, among the political class, there is an acceptance of the pressures on all our budgets, particularly in terms of capital uh, and resource. So, the question is the priorities upon which you place in society and where you want the direction of travel to go. That is the heart of the question. I, I've, I have a capital budget which is 20 per cent reduced on last year. I have to make decisions moving forward. I will be making those announcements in the coming days, and I will be in the, in the Education Committee for further scrutiny around those matters. I remain hopeful that through in-year funding I will be able to access further capital funds uh, for ver various projects. And we are at a stage in education now where we have a significant number of pr uh, projects which, if not shovel-ready, are very, very close to shovel-ready and can react quite quickly uh, to the availability of funds moving forward. And I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I could ask the Minister what opportunities he believes exist in the realignment of his department in the years ahead. 
I think bringing children's services into the Department of Education is the right decision. It allows for a, a complete focus on, on the child and on the needs uh, and pressures and opportunities uh, on, on children moving forward. So I think it has been the right move. It, has been, uh, it is an opportunity going into the future uh, for the Department to engage at a, in, in the education and the well-being of, of the entire child. And as I've often said, standing here, that while we have many, many, many fine teachers, they can't do this on their own. And unless we look at all aspects of the child's life, education isn't going to work. I wonder if the Minister uh, tell the Assembly what priorities he would suggest the new board focus on? Well, um, I don't wish to bring the wrath of the Education Authority down on me in the first number of weeks of, uh, their, um, the, of them taking charge of, of, of the education remit. But it's quite significant budgetary challenges ahead. But I, I think the focus has to be for us all is improving educational outcomes for all our young people and ensuring that uh, where opportunities exist, they're exploited to the full, and where challenges exist, that there is answers and, and ways around found for our young people moving forward. I think the Education Authority presents a huge opportunity for our education system. Um, there's membership from a wide range of organisations who I suspect just naturally will come in initially thinking about the needs of their own organisation, but will quite quickly jail around a common cause, and that common cause has to be the educational well-being of all our young people. Thank you. And I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Minister, is my understanding that perhaps only up to as many as six post-primary schools in Northern Ireland is offering an A-level qualification in programming and coding? A qualification required by over 60% of companies in Northern Ireland who are looking for employees. Can you advise how serious you deem this to be and what action has been taken to address it? Um, I think the member may be referring to a new A-level which has recently been introduced uh, into the system. I, I don't have the exact numbers of schools providing that A-level, but we are providing training and support to schools for a broader, uh, or for a significant greater number of schools to take that A-level on, and in fact, it is very relevant to the STEM debate, which the Assembly is currently holding as well. I call Mr Buchanan for a supplement. Again, thank the Minister for his, uh, his, his answer. And does the Minister agree that this is an essential qualification that post-primary schools should be taken up? Well, certainly um, an essential qualification in terms of you're entering the field of, of computer science or, or computing moving forward. Uh, I, I would hope that, and this goes back to one of the other questions I was asked during question time, that the, where young people are entering, uh, are seeking to enter a career around computing uh, and ICT, that they are advised that this UA level is available and that it will significantly enhance their opportunities moving forward. But this all comes back to careers advice and good careers advice being given to young people so they, they know which pathway they want to choose and what qualifications they require to follow that pathway. Order, and uh, that is the end of uh, question time. Thank you, Minister. And uh, we now.